Okay, I have begun recording. It is 4.05. Um, welcome to the Boulder Junction As As Access District Commission's meeting, uh, TDM and parking. It is Tuesday, March 15th, 2023, and I will call roll. Susan Pratt. Sorry, sorry, here. Jennifer Shriver. I think we're waiting on Jennifer. She did say she was going to attend. Rebecca Dumashev. I'm here. Brian Cook. Hi there, present. Kevin Knapp. Present. And Robin Rohn. Present. Okay, and I will turn the meeting over to our chair for procedural items. Okay, thanks, Lisa. We have uh, the approval of the January 18th minutes. Motion to approve. Do we need to wait for Jennifer to vote on that? We do not need to wait for BJ Parking to approve. Um, so that would be reflected in the next minutes that it was approved by that commission. We usually just do the one vote. So you're yeah. saying we should we should still vote, but you'll just record that it was only approved for one. Correct. Okay. Sorry, Robin. I think you had seconded. I I was going to second. Yeah. Okay. We have a motion by Sue, second by Robin. Anybody opposed? Okay. All in favor. Minutes approved. Um, so lost my agenda here. Okay, public participation. Do we have any members of the public present? No, all the folks you see in the meeting are uh, staff. Okay, thanks, Chris. Consent agenda. Is there any items that uh, anybody would like to discuss further from the packet? Uh, it looks like on the consent agenda, there was the signage thing and there were proposals due February 28th. So do we have an update on that from staff? We do have both Teresa Pinkle and Lane Landreth on the call. Um, they're still working through selection, I believe, but there might be a, a brief update in addition to what was shared in the consent agenda. We do not have an agenda item or presentation specifically for the commission today. We have a pretty full agenda of other topics. Okay, thank you. And just briefly, I can add that we are doing an interview tomorrow um, with one of the top candidates for that project. So we'll have more information shortly. Fantastic. If there's nothing else on the consent agenda, we will uh, hand it over for our first staff item, which is fund financials. This is also on for consent. There was a fund financial uh, year to date statement um, as promised at our previous commission meeting. Um, but if there are no questions on current fund financials, we can move into matters from staff. Hearing none. Uh, yeah, Kristen, take it away, starting with uh, RTD, it looks like. Great. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. We do have a number of representations from RTD and their consultant team here to uh, present to you all on the Northwest Rail Peak Service Study and the Boulder Junction Service Update. Not sure who I'm handing it over to, but um, it looks like Patrick. And we can't hear you at the moment, if you don't mind. There we go. That. Sorry, I didn't unmute. I'll take it. Um, yeah, so so um, is it, um, I know we sent a PowerPoint slide deck earlier. Is it better for me to just share my screen? That um, would be preferred. Thank you. Yeah, no worries. Patrick, a co-host. Mm -hmm. Great. Let's see if this, uh, more of a Teams person, to be honest with you. So you have to let, let me know if you can see that okay, or maybe it's not working. Not yet. Now we can see it. Can you see it? Yep. Not great. Um, 
Well, thank you very much. Um, my name is Patrick Stanley. I'm the uh, project manager for the Northwest Rail Peak Service Study. And uh, we'll jump right in. today with me. Uh, we've got Rick Pilgrim, who is the, the uh, project manager for the HDR consultant team that's working with us. Um, they're doing a fantastic job and appreciate all their work. Um, and without any more delay, let me uh, jump into it. Sorry, I'm trying to move some stuff around on my screen here. Sorry about that. All right. So yeah, we're here today to give an update on where we are, uh, what we've done, um, some feedback we've gotten from the recent open house meetings. Um, and let me jump into what we'll kind of started at a, at a high level on uh, second. I can't. Oh. There we go. Okay. So starting at a high level, what is Northwest Rail? Um, many, I'm sure many of the people on this on this call, I know for I know for a fact that a couple um on this call are very familiar with what we're doing here but um northwest rail was part of the 2004 fast tracks program that was approved by uh voters of the state uh it's a 42 mile rail line that runs from uh denver union station to longmont uh proposed rail line that runs from denver union station to, to longmont uh six miles of that was completed in as part of the eagle project in 2016 uh, that runs from dus to the existing westminster station near 72nd lowell and then the the additional 35 miles will run uh, on BNSF tracks um, between that existing Westminster Station and Longmont. So this is this is something new for RTD. Uh, we we haven't really run on uh, a freight track uh, so far in our system. Um, so this is a little bit unique. Um, right now we are evaluating uh, a peak service concept, and we'll get into more details of what that what that means here in a second. Um, so a little bit about the history. Um, like I said, it was it was uh, part of Fast Tracks, which was approved in 2004. Um, and we did the environmental evaluation in 2010. Uh, the environmental evaluation considered a full service, 55 trips a day, full double tracking of the entire corridor and um, 11 new stations. Due to funding constraints, we weren't able to implement it at that time. Um, so we, we went into the, the Northwest Rail Northwest Area Mobility Study 2013-2014, um, in which where we looked uh, worked with our partners and in, in uh, local transportation uh, stakeholders uh, for kind of near-term mobility projects. In that particular uh, study, the Northwest Rail was determined to be still very, still important, but it was really looked at as more of a long-term long-term project um, as part of that study. Uh, 2016, as I mentioned, the B line opened uh, for the uh, for the first segment of the corridor, and then now we're looking at in 2017 the concept of peak service really started coming to fruition, which we are now investigating. So, what is peak service? So, uh, peak service is three uh, three weekday morning trips from Longmont to Denver, um, and then three weekday evening trips back from Denver to Longmont. Uh, we're partnering with our local jurisdictional partners. Uh, to look at six new stations. Uh, those stations are in uh, Westminster, Broomfield, uh, Louisville, Boulder, and Longmont. Uh, we're, we're looking uh, to identify some feasible locations for a uh, maintenance facility up in Longmont because we will have a different fleet uh, with different requirements. Uh, we want to, obviously, the railroad is a pretty major component of this whole piece. They own the infrastructure, so we're coordinating with the BNSF to identify what needs to happen uh, to partner and run on the BNSF court, uh, tracks. Uh, we're looking at evaluating potential train types and technologies. And of course, we're exploring opportunities and potential partnerships. One, one in particular that's, uh, that we're excited about is the Front Range Passenger Rail. So the proposed new stations that we're looking at, uh, downtown Westminster near 88th, uh, Broomfield, 116th, Flatiron, downtown Louisville, Boulder Junction at Depot Square and downtown Longmont. So here's a, a blow up of the Boulder Junction at Depot Square. Uh, this is a little bit conceptual at this point. We're, you know, working with uh, uh, with our stakeholder team, uh, which includes uh, Gene and Danny, um, actually helping us out with this to kind of determine some of the details, which which need, still need to be filled in on this particular plan. But here's our uh, Boulder Junction at Depot Square facility here, uh, Goose Creek, where we currently have a have an have an underpass um, underneath the alignment. 
This is the rough location that we're looking at for the platform. And then we're also investigating a potential uh, additional underpass in this area as well. It's important to note that we do, uh, we are looking at putting the platforms on a siding track. Um, and the reason that we wanna, we wanna do that, um, and the intent is we stay completely within the, uh, the railroad right of way. But the reason we wanna do that is that allows us to provide a level boarding platform. Uh, so I think in the past, we've looked at a lower level platform scenario, uh, but by having it on siding tracks, it's just like the rest of the commuter rail system that RTD has where the platform is raised and you can walk directly from the platform straight onto the train without stairs or ramps or the high blocks. And I'm sure we'll have questions about this and we can come back to this slide if there are any specific questions um, after, after we go through the presentation, if that's all right. So partners and collaboration, uh, like I said, I mentioned there's at least a couple of people on this call that are that sit on our study advisory team. Uh, we have a great uh, we have great support from the community and representatives from the jurisdictions. Uh, you know, together working with CDOT, BNSF Railway, uh, Front Range Passenger Rail District. You know, our goal is to really develop a safe, reliable, and connected multimodal transportation network in the area. <clears throat> So why is peak service feasible for Northwest Rail? Uh, you know, given the fact that we have limited resources, um, it's a, the peak service would result in a little bit, uh, not, maybe not quite as much um, daily service uh, routes. It also has a, has a little bit more limited infrastructure that we would have to build out. Um, so it's a way that we think that we could, we can deliver a rail solution to the Northwest area sooner rather than later. Um, we mentioned the cost effective, uh, approach to go forward. It accomplishes a lot of initial track improvements that would need to be done, whether or not we're doing full service or a more limited peak service. Um, but that allows us to have a foundation for when we increase service in the future. We've got that, we've got some of those, uh, that infrastructure in place. Something, those type things might be something like positive train control, as an example, which is a requirement to run commuter rail service on, on any tracks. <clears throat> peak service has been proven to be a successful practice in other jurisdictions and other cities. Um, so we're not we're not reinventing the wheel here. This is something that we can learn from others on. Um, and it addresses um, some of the ridership needs of today while while still laying the foundation for future ridership expansion as as the ridership and demand grows. So when will train service start in my community? Um, right now to be clear, this is a feasibility study. Um, so what we're looking for, so there's no planned start date for the train at this time. Uh, we're, we're, want, we're looking at the requirements to upgrade existing rail tracks, uh, the freight tracks. You know, what do, what do we need to build out? What infrastructure do we need to have in, have in place? And then we want to identify a common set of facts, as we call it, which is how much does it cost? How much will it cost to operate? What are the benefits and impacts? And what strategic partners partnerships are out there that we can um, that we can target. Uh, we also want to outline potential funding sources that will allow us to hopefully bring this forward. <clears throat> so a little bit about the study schedule. Uh, the, the project is broken up into five milestones. Uh, milestones one and two are really more about fact finding. Uh, you know, what, what commitments have been put in place by the jurisdictions uh, since this was passed uh, and since the EE was done in 2010. So that's a little bit more of a, a fact gathering uh, exercise. Milestone three, which is where we are currently right now at the tail end of milestone three, which is really defining what our what our footprint is for peak service. What do we need to have in place? What do the stations look like? Where are, this, where are the, um, the BNSF track sightings, um, those type of items? And then uh, of course, we just had our first kind of major open houses for the public uh, that was back in uh, January 31st in Boulder. And February 2nd, we had one in Westminster. Um, and then from there, we want to look at, okay, what, what kind of options and partnerships are available? And then look at what kind of options and strategies and next steps um, are available for us to move forward. So milestones, so we'll touch a little bit on the milestones one through three, the community outreach and input. Um, this is some of the information that we learned through those open houses. So community input um, by the numbers. So uh, we had about 175 total people in the two open uh, uh, visitors from the two open houses, 120 in Boulder, 75 in Westminster. Uh, we got about 29 total comment cards between those two. Uh, but our self-guided online 
meeting was where really most people uh, went to, to give us comments. We had about 3,300 views on our online meeting. Uh, that meeting ran a little bit longer. It started before the open houses and ran a little bit beyond the open houses. Uh, we had about 173 surveys completed um, through the online meeting. And then on the RTD study website comment forum, we had about 352 people provide comments and sign up for emails uh, in, that, in that period. So the early study team takeaways that we had, um, this, is, this is kind of from the team and from the, from the study advisory team, our SAT members, is that in general, um, there, was a, there was some excitement uh, for the conversation to renew. Uh, it's been a little bit since this has been talked about. Uh, there were some concerns with the peak service and maybe it wouldn't necessarily work for everybody. But in general, we ran and we had comments from a lot of people that um, even though it may not work for them right now, they appreciated they appreciated the a potential start for the service that could be expanded to be something that would be be useful for them in the future. Uh, we've got some uh, we had quite a few concerns about maybe a reverse commute uh, if we're coming into Longmont or of to DUS from Longmont in the morning that maybe there's a way to get back um, sometime during the day, go the other direction in the morning. Um, there were some comments about some additional stations, perhaps that maybe Gun Barrel or Niwot. Uh, wanted a lot of curiosity about potential partnerships, front range passenger rail as an example, and the BNSF railway, and what would those look like? Uh, cost and ridership differentials, uh, peak service to full build. So, you know what? What are the what are the costs between a full build and and a peak service scenario? And what is the ridership difference between those two? Uh, service for customers with non-traditional commute times was brought up uh, several times, which is you know somebody who might be in the hospitality industry or service industry, uh, and they don't have necessarily a traditional commute time. Uh, a lot of uh, questions and concerns about growth around the stations, and you know that kind of covers a full gamut of a lot of things. Um, you know, are we stretching the infrastructure at the stations beyond what's what's available? Uh, you know, what what does that development around the station look like? Um, those sort of questions. And then, of course, kind of the, the big one down here is, you know, OK, so what if it what if peak service uh, turns out to maybe be cost prohibitive? What are the next steps if that's if that's the case? So, so these are some of the things that we heard, you know, taking the community community comments. I would I would say that a lot of the comments that we got from the community were were pretty similar to what to what our takeaways were um, as the design team and as the study advisory team. Uh, but a few other ones, you know, again, statements about the overall study. I think there were a general. It was a positive uh, uh, positive feedback that we were getting. Uh, there were some interesting uh, heard from several people that were excited about seeing it, seeing it, especially people that were maybe new to the area and didn't really anything, didn't really know that much about the Northwest Rail or the history of it. And there were quite a few people that were coming to the area from uh, a city where maybe they had more uh, uh, rail transit uh, and they were excited about it as well. So, um, and then, you know, just overall that, uh, you know, I think, um, um, some excitement that, that, that RTD is, is still looking at this as a commitment uh the for fast tracks um that we're still trying to find out a way to to hopefully move forward on this um station areas uh again uh potential locations of the stations uh had some comments on that additions as we talked about earlier and then other topics uh integrated service options so how can how can the existing rtd uh transportation network tie into the stations um how can it tie into the corridor how can we complement some of the other RTD transit and local uh, transit systems. Um, and one of the other big uh, comments that we heard too is, you know, is it going to impact any of the other, other services that we have? So if we bring in Northwest Rail, what does that do to the services that we currently have in the area? Um, and I think that's probably more of a concern about are we going to reduce or cancel some of those other services? Uh, land use, as we talked about, um, what we kind of heard more from the public was really more of a, of a idea about whether or not it's going to be more of a private development, a TOD, is it going to be more of a public space? Um, you know, what is that, what do those station areas look like? And then of course we heard some um, concerns about the construction, which is we're not quite there yet, but um, you know, obviously when construction does happen that there are going to be, you know, concerns about how that affects the, affects the public. 
So a little bit of the feedback. So we did a survey. Um, this particular question is, please select all the reasons why the service would not meet your needs. Um, kind of the, the bigger, the big groups here were really more about service times, um, service directions. So need weekend, weekend service was the biggest one. Um, it should be, it should be noted that people could enter more than one more than one uh, concern uh, in in the survey. So if you see that the numbers don't exactly add up to the numbers that we threw out as far as the participation, that's why. Uh, it was interesting to note that six you know sixty of the respondents said you know there really wasn't anything that that stood out to them as as a uh, a reason why the service would not meet their needs. Uh, you know midday service, evening service and uh, opposite commute kind of round out the next three. Um, and then of course, station locations, and then the proposed route does not stop near a key a key destination uh, towards the tail end. So next, one of the other questions we asked is, what do you see as the benefits of the peak service rail plan? And I was, th this was actually, to me was um, um, hopeful um, because, you know, what I, what I liked about this is actually there were a lot of, a lot of people uh, identified a lot of benefits. And, you know, that goes from the top one being just avoid being stuck in traffic. Uh, I think we can probably all, all agree with that one. Uh, reduce vehicle emissions, opportunity to use commute, uh, to read, work and rest. Uh, gave this presentation again uh, earlier this morning and I can, I can uh, certainly testify that I have fallen asleep on a train before. So um, I, can, I can understand that one. Um, <clears throat> You know, just new transportation opportunities, and you know that gets to one of the things that we're talking about too. Is so maybe the train doesn't necessarily meet both directions, as an example. But if you took the train maybe into DUS, that doesn't necessarily mean you can't take the bus back. So it's a little bit about transportation options as well. Um, it provides another layer of transportation option uh, for having a Northwest Rail uh, peak service, uh, potentially faster way to reach destinations. Uh, safer way to travel, um, and then this enhanced mobility for people who really uh, who uh, rely upon transit. And then uh, kind of the last one is really the reduced transportation cost. And this is really more of a personal cost. Um, you know, I think your your uh, car payment, uh, gasoline, uh, parking, uh, that and whatnot. So this is a question we ask about the Longmont uh, a maintenance facility up in Longmont. Um, which are which factors are most important to consider when evaluating a site for the proposed maintenance facility. <clears throat> I should note that most of the people that actually responded to this don't actually live in the area of the of our potentially proposed uh, uh, commuter rail facility. Um, but you can you can imagine that the ones that are pretty typical that you would you would guess would be the ones that people are concerned about, which is noise impacts, air quality and emissions and traffic disruptions uh, round out the biggest three. And then from there, it gets into the lesser concerns of animal habitat, uh, number of private properties impacted and visual impacts. So the next steps. Um, so we obviously had these open houses and you know we're, we continue to define the initial footprint of stations. We wanna refine the design and really kind of hone down, hone into the numbers and sharpen our pencils and make sure that we have got um, costs and mitigations and impacts properly captured. Uh, we want to use the public input that we got in this first open house and and look to see how that informs our study. Um, are there any mitigations or modifications that we need to make as, as a result of that input? Uh, we'll continue to compile the common the draft common set of facts. Uh, those are the costs, the ridership, the benefits and impacts. That's still a work in progress and it will be for some time. Um, we will do, be doing an update to the RTD board in April to the April 11th to the uh, Finance and Planning com Committee, if anybody's interested in joining that, uh, that meeting to see what questions and concerns come out of that. And then, of course, we've got another kind of our next set of public open houses uh, scheduled, looking to do that in late spring, early summer uh, to really kind of go over what, what the final results were in Milestone 3 and discussed, uh, discussed some of the uh, early concepts from Milestone 4. And that concludes the presentation and I, I will um, open it up for, for any questions anybody has. Thanks, Patrick. If you don't mind, stop sharing your screen and it looks like Commissioner Dumochelle has her hand up.
I will stop sharing my screen as soon as I can figure out how to do that real quick. It's at the bottom. There we go. Did there that do go. it? Okay. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. All right. Um, on the reverse commute thing, I actually had a couple questions. Like, why doesn't why doesn't it go both ways? That was the same with FF4 and FF6 as well. Like, yeah, so um, peak service came, you know, and it was actually a collaborative effort, peak service between between uh, the stakeholders in the area and RTD to come up with a, a uh, proposed service that would, you know, what we're trying to do is we're trying to we're trying to find a way to get a starter service going. Um, so it's definitely a limited limited service. And the idea being that it, it would make it more manageable uh, for us to move something forward um, sooner sorry, than later. Sorry, is there just three separate trains and train operators that move in the morning and they don't, yeah. they just literally don't circle back? They circle back in the evening. So they basically okay. would stage down at the US and they would come back in the evening. So, right. what, so one of the questions is, you know, it's not a double tracked system. So we have a single being a set track. And you can imagine if you've got two trains going in opposite directions, you have to have Got it. a way for them to pass. Uh, and that's that's increased the um, infrastructure cost. Um, so again, the concept was try to come up with something that um, was a bit, it was an easier, easier lift uh, to, to move forward. Okay, I think I got confused because FF4 and FF6, the bus service also didn't run in opposite okay. direction. And yeah. those buses, I would imagine are actually circling, but maybe they're not either um what is what do you what do you believe the proposed capacity will be for those three trains each each oh help me out here rick um i think i think the train cars themselves i think they generally hold about yeah, there's a couple things there um there's a bnsf requirement um what they call the three the three axle rule um that kind of would require us i think to operate a three car minimum consist and you know each car, uh, depending on whether it's standing or seating, I'd say the average is probably what Rick is it about 160? Is that what you guys were looking at? Some somewhere around in that range. Um, seated would be 110. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. So and you know there, so there'll be three trains, uh, three trains in the morning. So that's each car. So the whole consist. You know we're looking at looking at over 300 or so for the consist. Okay, I have more questions, but I know Robin has questions, so I'll I'll pause okay. and let somebody okay. else take it. Sure. You can keep going, Rebecca. I just have one quick question. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Um, on the seated concept, you know, just the idea of that passenger experience. I know I was really excited when I was taking Flatiron Flyer um, into Denver while I was commuting regularly, but I really couldn't do work on the bus or really okay. anything just like how tightly the seats were positioned. Um, it was also really, really difficult to reach those, those you know, plugs between the seats for anybody okay. that has to bend down. So um, whenever you get to that point, you know, as a nicer train experience, maybe it's not quite so so cramped. Sure, I understand. Um, okay, and then, um, about the other concerns about displacing or replacing existing bus service, have y'all thought about like you would funnel people to the trains for the three train trips, but then use the existing buses and existing bus drivers to you know expand the hours of service for FF4 and FF6, right? Because right now they are also well, when they were running, they were peak service. Now, right now, they're not running at all. But sure. Um... Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. And um, uh, for those that might be familiar with the RTD standard uh, or system optimization plan, um, which is supposed to be fully rolled out by um, 2027, so that that will real establish. I don't I don't believe it establishes it's 100% pre-pandemic, um, but it will. It is set to to reestablish quite a few of the flat iron flyer services. Um, so we would we would not. I would not anticipate at this point, and I, you know, um, this is being recorded, so I got to be. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I, I don't know that I would anticipate any any change to the flat arm flyer above and beyond what the service, the system optimization plan is calling for. What we are looking at right now is we're we're working, working with our service planners to talk about how do we get how do we potential get feeder service, feeder buses routed into the area, um, and 
and that's kind of a combination of ones that might be able to go down to the stations from the existing feeder lines and potentially FlexRide. FlexRide is a big one that we're looking at to potentially help um, supplement and, and provide additional service to get to the trains. I don't know that it's not really necessarily our, our um, uh, method. You know, we're not really looking to try to funnel people particularly specifically to any one of the any one of the, the services like trains versus buses. Um, as, we, as we're thinking about it, it's more of a complimentary service um, and providing more flexibility and more options for, for riders in the area. Okay, yeah, I'm, just, I, I'm looking at it with multiple hats. So one of them is, is as a path commuter, um, mm -hmm. having expanded service hours would make it easier to take it right instead of having to walk my dog and make sure I didn't catch, and you know, that I caught the last bus heading out and right. make it to work on time. Um, and then, you know, returning in the afternoon, making sure that I didn't stay too long to talk to my boss and get caught and now I have to figure another way home. Right. Um, so being able to span that and then a using the resources that we are absolutely going to run to the best of our abilities. Right. So if there's mm -hmm. 110 seats on the train and we're already running the train and we're already using the emissions that go with that, wouldn't it make sense to optimize that as much as possible? Um, so those are the different hats that I'm, I'm weighing here. Okay. Interesting. Robin. All right. Thanks for the questions. Hey. Appreciate it. Good questions. Becca always asks the questions. So I would say I've, I also have found it impossible to work on the bus ride down to Denver, but that's mostly a motion sickness issue, which I quite frankly don't experience on trains to the same extent. So I don't know if that's in any way a uh, benefit there. So in not reinventing the wheel, you said that this is based upon programs that have been existing already in Seattle, Salt Lake City. I don't remember off the top of my head, a couple of the other ones. Mm -hmm. So what, do we have numbers on how utilized this is and some of the drawbacks that they've found in implementing that program already? You know, I would say I would say I may I may defer uh, to Rick on this one just a little bit, but but I, I don't I think we're still compiling some of that information um, for, you know, we did have a conversation with our last SAT uh, meeting, which was, OK, so what were their projected starting mm -hmm. riderships on those on those um, examples the other examples and you know what what were the numbers right after they started service and what numbers you know how did that grow mm -hmm. um so rick i don't want to put you on the spot here too much but i know that last conversation which was probably about a week and a half ago um really kind of started was started that conversation okay how do we pull some of this information some of these numbers together uh, to get a better feel for exactly how it worked on those um those other services um rick i don't know if you have anything you want to add add to that well uh, <laughs> maybe a couple of quick examples seattle for example uh had their fast tracks vote in 1998 uh, one of their commitments that was uh, within two years they would have uh, commuter rail service between seattle and tacoma uh, and they achieved that with uh, two round trips a day they did that uh, with the bnsf railway as uh the owner of the track and in partnership with, with BNSF. Uh, Amtrak also runs over that route uh, to connect to Portland or on down on the Coast Starlight to California. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a good route and, uh, and well-maintained. Um, from those two trips a day in about the year 2000, um, they're now up to 10 round trips a day and uh, this is pre-pandemic. They carried about 6 million passengers that year. So um, we were, we're putting together the more detailed information that our SAT members asked us for. Um, and that'll be a pretty concise table that uh, we'll, we'll make that available probably in, uh, before the next round of public meetings. And I just have one other question, which was, and I apologize, it probably was in the map you showed us earlier, but my assumption, which might just be wrong, is that this would also be assuming we're doing a park and ride, like we have at Table Mesa mm -hmm. and some of the other locations. And if so, do we have an idea of where that would go? Because that um, would be part of the overall parking. Yeah, and I may try to, let me see, oh, well, I'm not sure anymore. Um, 
Yeah, it kind of depends on the station. So um, particularly, I'm assuming you're talking about the Boulder one. Um, so the Boulder station, um, we're, we're not looking at doing a park and ride for that for that particular station. So, you know, we think this falls under the, you know, what we've heard from Boulder, which is the low car or no car uh, uh, development um, that, that, the, that the city is after. Um, and, and Gene and, and Danny, you guys, you guys, you can kick me if I'm saying something wrong here. But um, so we, we have an existing facility at the Boulder Junction and Depot Square. Um, so we're not looking at building anything additional to that. So if anybody wants to ride by car, they can utilize that facility and make their way over to over to the platform. But we're not looking to do a park and ride. I think we're looking to do really look at uh, how we handle neighborhood connections and how we can connect into the facility with around through the surrounding development. And I might, it, it, Gene and Danny, if there's anything you want to add to that, that's uh, uh, that's our explanation of it. And, but yeah, we're not we're not looking at doing a parking ride in the for the Boulder location. Yeah, Patrick, I think you stated it well. No, um, we're not looking to add any more parking. Um, we are looking to provide drop off and ADA accessible locations for folks to get um, to and from the train platform. Um, but we feel like the parking is pretty well built out as it is in the Boulder Junction area. So thanks. Thank you. I see, oh, I see Ryan, sure. Ryan, okay. Um, yeah, that answered one of my questions, which was if the existing garage was going to be considered the main parking um, utility for the, the train station. Are the current stations that you're considering where existing sidings are on the railroad? Or because I know there is a siding where you highlighted in the depot square area. Um, I'm just kind of curious if that is the intended station, basically. Yeah, there's a. Um... Um, a lot of conversations to still go on that. Uh, we, we're, we're really uh, just kind of really just getting in the beginning engagement with the BNSF. Um, but I would say that there are some that might be coincidental. I, I would say that that's probably going to be a new sighting at that location. It's, it's, there is something there, you're correct. Um, but BNSF is going to, uh, there's two different kinds of sightings. So just, just to kind of back up a little bit, there's passing sightings which the intent is that the BNSF will actually pull over onto the passing sidings. Uh, there's, there's right now, BNSF has told us there's four of them um, along the 35 miles between the existing Westminster Station and Longmont. And the idea is that they would pull out of the way and allow RTD to operate, um, prior, have the priority operations during a certain time window. Um, and that would allow us to go back and forth without having to worry about inter any interference with the freight train, getting stuck behind a freight train, that sort of thing. And then the, the sightings themselves for the stations, the platforms, if there is one there, and I think Louisville has one, um, it's kind of designed out for one to, put, for, to potentially be there already. Um, but we didn't necessarily locate the platforms specific to maybe where there are sightings. Uh, the platform locations and the station locations are really more about community location and connectivity and, uh, you know, just make sure that we can make sure that makes sense to where we're putting them. Um, so yeah, we didn't, we didn't look at the kind of the corridor and say, oh, there's a siding, let's put a station there. Um, so it's really, the, the sidings are following the lead on, on where it makes sense to put stations and platforms. <clears throat> Super helpful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, maybe this question is kind of a combo for staff and yourself, but I'm just curious when, if we're starting to picture a station in that area, kind of close to Valmont along the tracks in Boulder Junction, um, thinking about passenger drop-off and things like that. I mean, it's pretty tight, you know, small streets, not a lot of pull-offs, buildings are pretty close to the, the tracks. I'm just kind of curious, like, is the initial push for the um, peak service times having, when you say station, maybe people or myself might picture something kind of built out and larger and enclosed or something. Is it something, it maybe is the station at that point more lightweight, open air, you know, covered with some displays or something like that to show service time? I'm just kind of curious, like what, what does it look like sure. to have a station in that area? 
Yeah, and I, I think that's a that's a good question. Um, and we had uh, I don't unfortunately I don't have a slide available right now to to pull up, but I don't know if you've if anybody's had any experience on any of the light rail that we have light rail stations or commuter rail stations that we currently have. Um, I would say a good place to look at would be one of our existing commuter rail uh, commuter rail stations where it's a it's a raised platform. It's it's about it's it's fifty and a half inches above top of rail. Uh, sorry, that's very specific, but you know roughly four feet above top of rail. And, you know, we have uh, like the North Metro that just opened up has two canopies. They're kind of large over canopies for, you know, sh sheltering you from from the weather. And then we have windscreens on the back. And of course, we have signage, light, emergency phones, trash cans, you know, all the amenities, benches, that sort of that sort of thing that kind of go along with it, as well as the sign displays that you're talking about. So it's a little bit of an open air. I guess I would call it an open air station uh, with some canopies to provide shelters. That's what that's what the expectation I would say would be the best for you to, to consider. Um, and if you have an opportunity to visit some of our uh, uh, existing rail stations, we can we can recommend ones for people to go go by and take a look at if you want to see what those what that feel of that is. Um, but I think it's for us we would build sort of that open air station, and then we would work really close with your staff um, in the city of Boulder to kind of figure out how those connections work. Right, how do how do folks get there from, you know, the east side is a development, east side of the tracks is a development uh, to be determined. Um, you know, I know I know that the city has worked started those those plans. I think phase, phase two um, of that development, and you know, we'll, we'll want to talk about how that works and how people get to an overpass, how they they can underpass, how they can make a connection into the into the station itself. But it's really about providing ramps, stairs, vertical circulation connections, and whatnot too. The existing uh, the existing network uh, pedestrian network around the area, and then uh, I don't know if uh, like you said it was a part maybe a partial question for staff. Um, I don't know if Danny or Gene went went away in on that either, but um, that's what I would look at for your, an idea of what the station looks like. Cool. cool, that's great. Thank you. Hey Patrick, thanks so uh, so much for the presentation sure. and the uh, I thought the online meeting too was was really well done the, the self-guided tour i thought that flyover was was super helpful uh in that I, th I thought it was all just like a really great presentation so um well thank you, know. thank you. that's uh i'll give kudos to the hdr team uh for that they did a, they did a great job on that online presentation and and you know the beautiful vocal tones of rick pilgrim there was in the flyover so <laughs> <laughs> very nice yeah. Um, hey, two quick questions for you. Yeah. Uh, you the these commissions were uh, predicated on the assumption that the, the rail would be put in at the time, kind of in the early 2010s. And so I think we have a we have a lot of support within this commission. The, the, today was the the first that I saw about the assumption that there would be an underpass, kind of right where that rail line is intended to be. Um, would you anticipate that being in before this this rail uh, sort of interim process would, would occur? You know, I think that, that's a that's a good question. And just from a practicality standpoint, to build on rail, um, you know, you would have to build, you'd have to do a shoe fly. So you'd have to build probably one of the rails so that BNSF can operate in the interim. And you would have to build a portion of the tunnel and then you'd have to build the track on top of that tunnel, ship them over and then build like sort of the second half. It's, it's, a, it's a bit of a ballet uh you know procedure to do all that so i would um we got to talk a little bit internally we want to we kind of want to make sure that we're we're good on what we on what we define as the base configuration um but i think that certainly would be a, a major consideration as to whether or not this goes in now versus later because i think it would be pretty difficult to put it in later uh once both services are operating yeah, we, we've had a few of those happen in town here under yeah. underpasses under roads, and we know, you know how long those take and, and complicated um, complicated projects. Yeah, um, we did something one, very similar to the Westminster Station, if anybody was paying attention oh, yeah. to that one back in the day, uh, where we had to build it in two segments. And it's, it's easier to do when you have one service, one operator, uh, but when you have two and you're trying to move trains around, it gets, it gets pretty difficult to do. So. Got it. You know, one other question just out of curiosity, you know, as we've waited for for this project to occur, I've I've thought for the last ten years, you know, if only we we can be ready for the when we have uh, federally the next infrastructure bill comes about and we have a you know kind of a 
shovel ready type project that that needs some money. Are, are we able to apply for any uh, Inflation Reduction Act money, or is there any availability there that RTD is able to access? Well, we're trying to, uh, you know, one of the one of the things we want to do on this project is try to identify potential funding sources. Um, it it uh, one of the challenges that we've had in the past is kind of looking at the ridership numbers versus the because versus the cost of the project when it comes to federal funding. Um, I think one of the one of the very exciting things that we are looking at very closely is a potential partnership with Front Range Passenger Rail because I think the Front Range Passenger Rail really I think opens up a lot of doors that were probably previously closed to us when it comes to some of the funding opportunities. Um, now we are we are obviously looking at funding opportunities and you know because we need to consider consider the potential that we would have to go it alone as well. That is something we'd have to think of, think about is, you know, what if front range passenger rail doesn't happen? Um, you know, we still we still have wanted to look at what service would be. So I, I can't necessarily speak to, uh, you know, which grants necessarily we might be able to get available for, but that is part of the study. We're just not really quite ready to uh, to really make any uh, uh, sort of statements of, or predictions on that. Does that Thank make you. sense? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Appreciate you taking the time to join us. Yeah, oh, it looks like Ryan uh, Cook has a uh, question or has his hand up. Yeah, it was just kind of a follow yeah. on to what you said, Kevin, about the underpass. And I'm mm -hmm. just kind of curious, are we considering something in that area already for Boulder Junction phase two, regardless of train station, train service, et cetera? I mean, another connection in that area between Goose Creek and Valmont, I don't know. I'm just throwing it out there that maybe, maybe that might happen regardless of uh, train station. Yeah, and I know that area right now is kind of the, the back end of some commercial office buildings uh, on the east side of the track. So, not to speak for staff, but I'm I'm guessing that'll be a part of the second phase uh, BGAD planning. Yeah, thanks, um, Sarah. And you can correct me if I'm wrong, but you know the um, the Boulder um, or the Transit Village Area Plan Network Plan does identify an underpass between Valmont and Goose Creek. Um, and so I think you know we've asked the RTD team engineers to take a look at that and what it would entail. It's pretty tight um, on that west side, and we're we're still waiting to get a little bit more engineering information related to that. Um, but I do think that that's something that should be looked at more closely in phase two um, as we update yeah. those connections in the, uh, particularly on the east side and how to make those connections to the west. And Sarah, like yeah. I said, jump in if that's if that's not the case. Oh, wait, yeah. and let's highlight, do we have anybody else from the team? My team yeah, it's just me. Okay, never mind that. <laughs> Um, so I know they're not popular, but I will I will ask anyway. Has an at grade pedestrian crossing been considered? Um, yeah, I can speak to that just a little bit. So the, the challenge with an at grade crossing um, is the BNSF. Uh, yep. The BNSF BNSF is is they're going to say no to a, to a, our passengers crossing their tracks. Um, so it's it's easy. It's better to do a grade separation. I, I asked because not that I would out anybody for doing this, but people are definitely crossing at grade instead of walking down the muddy hill. Some, you know, sometimes it's muddy or slippery from ice or whatever um, when they're visiting businesses on the east side and then they're coming back to to the west side. So clearly, yeah. clearly it's meeting some need for some people, even it, when they're walking over uneven rocks and stuff. I agree. I agree. In fact, we were out there for a site visit one day and we, we saw that exact exact same. And the amazing thing is the BNSF crews were actually replacing the tra the ties and fixing the rail at the same time. And we're like, oh, man, I can't, you know, because BNSF takes that very seriously. Um, so I was a little bit surprised that they they didn't uh, kind of uh, get on them for that. But understand exactly what you're saying. You know, some of the things that we've done on some of our stations as well as and we kind of have to on some of these is sometimes we'll enclose part of our corridors with some sort of fencing or barriers of some kind to to try to try to deter that um you know obviously if we have a a grade separated access uh you know for the most part we found that people yeah people will use that um probably especially underpasses maybe even more so than overpasses just because 
but the overpasses you really have to go up uh, pretty high to clear uh, to cl do all the clearances. The minimum clearance over the BNSF is twenty three foot six. Um, so you can imagine that's a that's a bit of a staircase to go up and over. And and you know the easier you make it, the more people are going, the more likely it is people are going to use it. And Rick, I see uh, Rick's got his hand up. And <clears throat> yeah, just to to uh, mention the front range passenger rail would mm -hmm. uh, likely stop. Uh, at, at Boulder Junction, um, that's something that that uh, they're about nine or ten months behind us in putting their service development plan together. So uh, they'll they'll be looking at uh, a longer platform than the platform that we would be starting with. So th that that's another consideration is. Uh, for Northwest not to preclude any future expansion or enhancements. So working through all of those different pieces would be part of what we're doing now. Thanks, Rick. All right, any other questions, observations? Does not seem to be, and maybe it is a good segue for us to move into the Boulder Junction phase two agenda item with a quick update. Yes. Okay. <laughs> All right. So Sarah here from so <laughs> you can probably see a small version of me on the screen. So I'm Sarah Course. I'm the project manager for the Boulder Junction phase two project working in the comprehensive planning group. Um, and I will share my screen. So I do have a quick presentation that hopefully you guys are fine with. I'm going to see if I can do this. Cool. All right. Okay, so very quickly, I know you guys are very familiar with a lot of this, but I'm going to go over just some quick background. So as we're aware, Boulder Junction has evolved. Phase two is what we're calling reaching substantial completion. And um, yeah, we recognize that a lot of growth has happened. So with that, phase two is a great opportunity for new housing, jobs, community amenities, things like that. And it's become city council's priority to move forward and implement phase two of the transit village area plan. So this project, Boulder Junction phase two, will look at kind of how should future development in this area be guided? So quick, quick backgrounds. Again, apologies if you guys are very familiar with the transit village area plan, but in general, um, the transit village area plan is located within Belmont Road, Foothills Parkway on the east, the railroad and North Boulder Farmer's Ditch to the south, 30th Street to the west, and then there's also a small portion of the plan area that's also west of 30th Street. So in general, this plan it was adopted about 15 years ago, back in 2007, and it provides the general guidance for future development. So it has recommendations for land use, transportation connections, as well as transportation demand management. And then there's also an implement, implementation plan that was created to identify what would be implemented by how, who, and when. And that will definitely become part of this project as well. So we're familiar with phase one that the plan proposes as well as phase two. And then there's also this phase 2A that was proposed in the plan. This is kind of already started. So implementation has started for 2A. So our primary focus will be just the phase two area. As a reminder, the plan proposed future land uses. So in the phase two area, there's a variety of land uses. Uh, that we will reevaluate, I guess. The plan also proposed transportation connections, so looked at what new connections should occur as well as upgrades to existing connections. And then the plan also identified eight different character districts. So these character districts provided guidelines for the building design, placement, orientation, things like pedestrian amenities, wayfinding, and access. And kind of the key takeaway from these districts was that they really informed the regulations for the form based code that was developed and applied to the phase one area. In terms of the project framework, how we're looking at it is that there is two main parts of this project. So the first part is what we're calling plan amendment process. So kind of taking us now, you know, this winter from project kickoff all the way through the end of this year. So what will happen during this time is we'll review background information. We'll then identify the community's current and future needs. We'll develop alternatives for land use, transportation connections, and urban design or character of the area. And then we'll identify a preferred approach for potential changes to the transit village area plan. And those potential changes will go through the plan amendment adoption process. 
So looking at why are we doing maybe a plan amendment, I guess, is we're going back and we're saying that, you know, this, this plan is 15 years old. And we want to make sure that we're understanding how the community needs have changed over these past 15 years. And that if we need some revisions to the plan. So what we'll do when we go back and kind of evaluate the plan is we're going to look at a few specific areas. We're not going to evaluate the entire plan, but we will look at what the potential alternatives could be for land use. Um, again, we want to understand if the current or the proposed land uses still apply or if there are some changes that could be made. We'll look at if there's potential alternatives for the transportation connections. So just like what was discussed earlier, making sure that all the connections are still relevant or if there's some revisions that need to be made, especially if some new land uses might be proposed. And then we'll look at the character of the area. So we've heard some feedback around maybe the character that was proposed for the area or kind of the outcomes of phase one and making sure that we're still doing things that are aligned and we're still getting the outcome that we identified in the plan and making sure that we're getting kind of that public realm character and things like that. So that's a very quick summary of what we'll be doing as part of that plan amendment process. The second part of this project, which I think will definitely include you all a bit more, is when we would head and look at strategies for public improvements, and then we'll look at required code updates or regulatory updates. So again, during this part of the project, we will be defining what are those steps for public improvements. So as you guys are familiar with, like what are the new roads um, and infrastructure that might need to be built? We'll then also define the steps for funding and phasing. So how and when might new roads be built? And then we'll define the steps for updated regulation. So that might mean what requirements or incentives need to be in place to ensure that we're getting the outcomes that we'd like to see. But as part of that, I like to call out when we're looking at regulations and other parts of the implementation strategy, that's where we'll also consider transportation demand management and where this group might come into play when we're looking at the general improvement districts and how might we expand the TDM program into the phase two area as well. So that's a very quick summary of kind of the main components of the project. In terms of broader community outreach, so right now we're, we're moving through the project kickoff. We're planning to do a community open house where we'll discuss the project background and we'll look to receive feedback on phase one, kind of the outcomes of phase one, as well as opportunities for phase two. After that, then we'll go back to the community to get feedback on alternatives for, again, the land use, um, transportation connections, and character for the phase two area. And then we'll head into city council. So we'll try to do a study session with city council to again discuss these alternatives, but then also to get feedback on what a preferred approach might be for a plan amendment. We'll get confirmation again from the community about what this preferred approach might be, and then we'll head into the adoption process. So that's in terms of broader community engagement, it'll be more in that first part of the project. We are creating focus groups and we'll have focus group meetings throughout the whole project and we have four different focus groups. So we have a group based around property and business owners, a group that we're calling development and design. So it includes developers, architects, landscape architects, a group for advocates. So organizations and agencies that um, are advocating for something or these organizations that might be organizations or people that might be impacted by the project. And then the last group is what we're calling daily users. And this includes largely people that live in the Boulder Junction area and people that work in the area as well. So we're engaging these groups throughout the whole project and considering them kind of the major stakeholders. And we'll be sure to um, the groups that we engage might vary throughout the project as well. So it might vary when we get into the implementation stage. But in general, that's who will be engaging in addition to other boards and commissions. So lastly, just as a quick update of where we're at. So we just held the first focus group meetings the past uh, week or two, where we discussed the outcomes of phase one, as well as some initial opportunities for the phase two area. And then the next focus group meetings, we'll, we'll head in to discuss those alternatives for land use, transportation connections and character. And we'll align that with kind of the community open house as well. So right now we're at a point where we'll provide a summary of focus group feedback we're looking at scheduling the community open house, which we're nailing down a date and venue. We're trying to do it in person. So we're headed, hopefully it'll be sometime maybe around mid-April and we'll announce that fairly soon. And then we'll be scheduling the next focus group meetings. 
So that was my summary of a rapidable Junction Phase 2 project. And if you guys have any questions about it, um, I, I know that was a quick update, but the other thing is we'd like to come back to this group to give updates. But if you have feedback on how we should be engaging this group throughout this project, we're also open to that feedback as well. Real quick, Sarah, before we get into questions from commissioners, um, I understand there's a joint commission, multi-commission meeting uh, being scheduled. I didn't hear anything about that. We're, yeah, so our department or group is looking at creating, I think a, we're calling it a multi-board working group. And at this point, the updates are beyond me. Um, Brad or Nuria or Christopher Johnson might have a little bit more, so leadership might have a little bit more of an update on that. But what we're looking at right now is piloting something with this project, given the fact that it's a city council priority project, it's maybe more of a complex project where some of these changes will cross over, you know, engagement with multiple boards, different departments. And the fact that this project has somewhat of a faster timeline is we're looking at how can we engage these boards um, maybe at once. So we're looking at maybe having representatives from all different boards and commissions come together where we can give presentations and updates to just one group and one meeting and then hopefully expect that group to share those um, updates back to their back to their boards and bring feedback to us kind of simultaneously. But uh, as I'm aware, nothing's been scheduled yet and it's still in the process of kind of getting started. Great. So um, I know that the request is going to be of one uh, member of every commission. We have our chair of the downtown management commission is planning to participate. Um, and um, unless folks feel otherwise, our chairs of um, the BJAD commissions are uh, Commissioner Knapp and Commissioner Prant. Um, so we would plan to uh, extend the invitation to the chairs unless there is um, a desire of the commissions to um, uh, have somebody else represent uh, the commission at, the, at this joint meeting. And with that, we can move into to questions. And if you, and if you wanna uh, nominate somebody else uh, to participate in that joint commission meeting, so now would be a good time to, to provide that feedback. In hearing, oh, Commissioner Dumachal. Question, not, not any nomination. Um, I know several people who applied to the working group for TVAP phase two and for the airport, I believe, um, that didn't hear back that they weren't selected, right? So uh, just maybe a nudge to, to reach out to people that applied that weren't selected and let them know and close that feedback loop. Um, we did send an email to people that were not selected. So I don't know if that was for a different project or... Um, but as far as I know, we can double check and make sure that it reached everyone. Um, but we did send an email out to those that were not selected. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, and then I, I look forward to definitely having some of the, the land use um, reevaluated and stuff like that. I know it was disappointing when Boulder Brewery like, moved to like another lab space instead of being something that residents could use. Perfect. Thank you. Great, Chris, right. I know it's for the cross commission committee. Uh, I would be happy to uh, allow somebody to sit in my my spot there um, as board chair if there's anybody else that has interest. Yeah, Ryan, would you be willing to do that? Yeah, happy to. Um, I mean, I don't, I guess I don't understand the time commitment just from that description, but assuming it's roughly, yeah. you know, similar to the, you know, the the uh, well, I can't remember the name of the group right now that was discussing the the different parking uh, concerns that's happened over the last year and a half. You know, meeting every few months for a couple hours or something is is very doable. Yeah. The Access Allies group and yeah, that's right. Group. Sorry. Yep, I believe it would be uh, even less of a commitment than that. Mm -hmm. Would love to participate, Kevin, mm -hmm. if that's something that. Um, you're open to. Absolutely. I think Ryan would be a great representative for us. So um, if uh, Chris, if that's uh, okay with you and staff, uh, let's go ahead and um, plan on Ryan attending. Great. And then um, Commissioner Prant for uh, TDM. Yeah, I'm okay with going. Great. 
All right. Well, if there are no more questions on this phase of uh, uh, Boulder Junction uh, area planning, we can move on to our last matter from staff. Oh, nope, not our last, almost our last. Um, but thank you everybody for, you know, our folks from RTD and HDR, you're welcome of course to stay. Um, but uh, we have our, our, I'm not gonna say old friend, our longtime friend, Bill Cowern um, is joining us um, to share some analysis work that his team at Fox Total has been doing in Boulder Junction. Uh, with the commissioners to see how we're doing on our, our long-term goals for minimizing trip generation in Boulder Junction. Old, so then, old is fine. <laughs> All right, now it's my turn to share the screen. We are seeing an email. Oh, there we go. All right, excellent. All right, uh, thanks, Chris, and thank you, members of the um, Boulder Junction boards uh, for your time tonight. Again, my name is Bill Cowan. I'm with the Fox Tuttle Transportation Group, and we're here to talk about the 2020 TDM monitoring report. And uh, just by way of the background, uh, the monitoring program tracks the progress of the TDM district in meeting its goals. And, and this is something that's outlined in section 9.2.22 of the Boulder Revised Code. Um, there's a goal that's set in in those uh, in that section of a 45 percent um, trip making uh, 45 percent of what would be the potential or estimate from the ITE or Institute of Transportation Engineers trip generation manual. Um, this is a, a monitoring effort that's anticipated to be repeated every two years. Um, its last evaluation was in 2017, and of course, the COVID pandemic um, is the primary reason for the, the delay um, in, in doing that now. So when the prior uh, monitoring occurred, my colleague Bill Fox um, did that effort, and at that time, he also put together a TDM and parking district monitoring procedures document. Um, this document just outlines the procedures involved in doing this study. And we've tried to follow this as carefully as we can this time for our, our TDM uh, evaluation. Well, the junction, as was previously noted, um, has grown quite a bit since that study was done in 2017. There are a lot more access points a lot more streets involved. And so we did have to um, make some, some decisions about how to do that work, which we'll get into. And this is just the highlights of uh, that um, study procedure. It involves documenting existing land uses, calculating uh, trips using the ITE rates, um, doing traffic counts to see what the traffic is currently, and then comparing them to see how you um, whether you meet that 45% goal or not. So the first step is the trip generation and the, the potential BJAT land uses. And to do this, we created a, um, a parcel map, um, 25 distinct parcel zones. Um, most cases, these parcels have a single structure upon them. Uh, some like the hotel and the Rev and Google have you know, multiple structures upon them, but each is a distinct parcel area. For each of these, we needed to determine the land use types and the trip generating factors that needed to be, um, they had to be determined uh, in order to do the trip generation. And then since we would be counting in these three distinct areas with Pearl and 30th ordering them, um, we, decided to create subtotal areas, the, the area to the north of Pearl, the area that sits on the southeast corner, and then the Google site. So we'll be able to provide data for each of those subtotals and then the total uh, BJAD TDM district. 
Certainly one of the biggest challenges was determining um, the land use and all the applicable information that is on the site today. We used a variety of different sources to do this. We started with uh, the information that we had initially in 2017. We had information from the City of Boulder's Planning and Development Services. They have a, a wonderful development review cases website that provided a lot of information about um, actions that were allowed to be taken on the site that included um, square footages and information like that. The Boulder Chamber of Commerce had information about uh, land use on the site. Uh, the City of Boulder's GIS data had information both from a sales tax and a business perspective. And unfortunately, having done all of that, that still didn't quite get all of the land uses that were out there. So um, we went out onto the site, we talked uh, with businesses, uh, we talked with their staff, um, and then we went and we did some internet searches to try and find uh, information on, on square footages and information like that. And I think this effort um, has, has resulted in a fairly complete um, summation of the, the land use within the Boulder Junction area. This, is, this chart just basically shows um, that information, uh, there were 43 distinct land uses uh, that we were able to identify, considerable amount of housing, uh, commercial uses, office space, restaurants, um, and of course, the hotel. And then we were able to um, get, again, the information needed to calculate uh, trips for each of these distinct land uses. And then we did that calculation. Um, housing trips in the uh, ITE trip generation manual are based on the number of dwelling units. Commercial office and restaurant trips are based on their gross floor area square footage and the hotel trips are based on the number of rooms. And specific to this evaluation, we were focusing on the PM peak time period. That was the, uh, the time period that was identified in 2017. And we, we did that again this time. And that led to this summation of uh, a trip estimate for the Boulder Junction area. There's a uh, in the total Boulder Junction area, a little more than 2,000 trips would anticipate to be generated according to ITE, with more than half of them being in that northern parcel set of parcels north of Pearl Parkway. And then step two is estimating the actual trip generation um, based on observed counts. And to do that, we did a, a very robust data collection effort um, on the site. There were uh, 26 distinct traffic count locations where we collected that PM peak hour data. It was collected on the week of October 24th in 2022, again, counted during that PM peak period. And again, subtotals calculated for that northern, southeastern, and Google set of parcels. And that led to this information, which again, uh, 850 some odd uh, trips in the total area with about half being in that Northern area. And then a comparison of those two yields the results that you're looking for. The parcels North of Pearl are um, much lower than the IT estimates their total budget status was 33%. Parcel south of Pearl and the Google site, they were higher um, than that threshold, but they also generated fewer trips overall. So when you combine it all together um, in the total Boulder Junction area, um, the, the, you are below that 45% threshold currently for this estimation. And just as a reminder, back in 2017, uh, that this, this uh, effort resulted in a calculation of 58% of ITE trip making. It now results in 42%. But, and that is great news. And I hope that um, 
seeing that uh, makes you very happy. Um, however, there are many factors that need to be considered in this as well. And we would be remiss if we didn't bring that up. Um, there are still what we would call lingering COVID factors that are going on that are influencing trip making regionally and certainly in the city of Boulder. Residents are still working from home um, in certainly much larger numbers than at the time when those, um, those, those studies were done to determine the ITE trip generation rates. Correspondingly, people who um, are working at home are not going into the office. And so there's quite a bit of office space in Boulder Junction um, that is not seeing the use that it was seeing pre-COVID. There's vacant commercial space. And this is particularly important because um, as part of a successful TDM area, you would, you would want to have a combination of um, land uses that support each other. And you would want to have people who could just live in a building and pop down to the ground floor and, and use commercial um, space rather than making trips somewhere else. And with so much of the, of the commercial being vacant, um, those trips are now being made away from Boulder Junction and some portion of those trips are being made by car. And then of course, there's the lack of transit service at the RTD station. This is a, a transit oriented development and there isn't transit service at the station. Um, and that certainly has an influence on trip making. And there's construction tra traffic um, with, with as much construction that is going on currently. Some portion of that is occurring in the PM peak um, and is adding to the trip making. So some of these factors would lower the, the trip making. Some of them would increase the trip making. They may very well wash out. They certainly are significant factors though. Um, and we, we needed to bring them up in your consideration of, you know, the, the validity of, of this uh, evaluation. So with that in mind, um, you know, our recommendation would be in two, the two year threshold for doing this again would start in the fall of 2024. Um, if you are able to view the conditions at that time and see that maybe there is reduced construction, some of these COVID impacts have been reduced, um, you know, residents working from home, if that has sort of solidified into a new norm, right? If those things are happening, go out and, and do the TDM monitoring again, and hopefully you'll get results very similar to what, uh, what we've shown you here today. Thanks, Bill. Yep. If you don't mind, uh, oh, oh, oh yeah, we'd like to see her. There you go. <laughs> and then I'll stop sharing. <laughs> Thanks, Bill. Um, looks like we have a question from Commissioner Michelle. Um, as you just pointed out, there are a lot of factors that are affecting the current trips, right? But I, I would like to point out that a lot of those offices didn't exist in 2017. Um, so them being vacant now is kind of consistent with total numbers, not with percentage of numbers, but with total trip numbers, right? Like that's not maybe not as big of a leap as, as you might think because they didn't exist before. And a lot of the housing didn't exist either in 2017, so. Yeah. I sure. don't remember when Google finished. Yeah, and, I, and, and this might have a little bit to do with the sort of the procedure that's used, right? Um, but I'll just use an example. Uh, one, of, one of your office buildings there is Uplift. Um, uh, in the north section, and there, I think it was, I thought it was uplift, but um, there are about 42,000 square feet of office space. And um, there, uh, I, I went in there and, you know, talked with them about their their use and, and their space. And there certainly were not 42,000 square feet worth of people working there at that time, right? So, um, we're calculating based on a 42,000 square foot usage of that site because that's what's being leased to that to that building. And 
but they're not generating 42,000 square feet worth of um, trips from an employment standpoint. And that may, I mean, that may be the new norm or it may be that um, that would change over time. And it's, it's hard to imagine that land use will continue to be used like that, that it wouldn't shift into a different kind of stability. All right. Are any other questions for Bill? If none, um, I have got to run, but I'm going to hand the, the mic over to Sam Bromberg, who is here to provide a quick signage update um, that we're pursuing community vitality. If there are any other items that come up in matters from commissioners or later on in the, the meeting, um, Lisa will be here to record and uh, can certainly get back to you um, as soon as possible. Um, uh, after today. So over to you, Sam. Thanks, Chris. And hello, commissioners. Thanks for welcoming me back again. Um, I promise to be very, very quick with my update because this slide is essentially it. We're making some changes and updating our signage infrastructure across the city. And so you'll be seeing some changes soon in Boulder Junction. Um, these are our new pay to park signs on the left. You've got sort of the more informational sign on the right. That sign is associated with where the meters are. Um, so we're hoping to take a more consistent approach across the city and, and update that signage. Great to meet you. Um, <laughs> any questions? Great. That's all I got. OK, thank you. Let's see what else, um, if anything, we have the agenda. Uh, that brings us to matters from the commissioners. Sue. So there was a whole lot in the packet about the curbside access, but we're not going to discuss that. That was an information item only, but I'm happy to um, you know, receive feedback and bring that back to staff or if you no. have questions if you have questions and you know we can send the answers out to you um no i guess when is this uh, oh it's going to council on okay yeah i had some questions but i read it and sort of understood it, but i guess okay if you you know can think of anything that you want to ask you know, please get in touch with me, email me. I'll get some answers for you. I might be able to take a stab at some answers to Sue if there's anything that is that you're very curious about. I'm I'm tangentially involved in that project, so I might be able to help. I understand they wanted to come tonight, but I don't think there was enough time in the meeting to be scheduled. And so I think that was the conflict. Okay. I guess I have one question. So it's going to tab when? I believe they've already been to tab once and they'll likely go back again. Um, right now, they were just giving an update, but they're going to go back when they actually want tab to make a recommendation to council to adopt the curbside management guidebook. Okay. All right, well, I'll just keep an eye out for that because we'll probably comment on that. Okay, thanks. Sorry, I can't be more specific. Any other comments from commissioners? You know, at least I'll just make one, you know, passing comment so that in our, our last few meetings, I think we had some some pretty robust conversations about uh the BJAD parking district and the the budgets there and the financials were helpful to kind of get a sense of um at least the economic status of, of that district, but it would be great to just get an update on when we'll have a kind of a broader conversation regarding you know, the, the future of the district. Yeah, I read through the minutes today, Kevin, and saw that was a major focus of the last meeting. 
So, um, you know, if you want me to, I'd like, I can put that on the agenda for next time and we can get you maybe an update. Perfect. Yeah, that, that'd be great. I, th I think some questions came up, you know, in the last few meetings that um, we're, we're just going to expand upon and try to uh, project out into the future. Absolutely. All right. Does anyone have anything else? And Lisa, I saw you included the refreshers on uh, Robert's rules in there. So I will make a proper motion to adjourn. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> Is there a second? Great. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Robin. All right. Nice to see everyone. Thanks, Steph. Thanks, Thank everyone. You. Have a good Bye. night.